Spooky season is finally here, so let's talk about some sinfully good books featuring Satan and demons. Me and the devil Walking side by side Hello, bookworm. My name is Hannah Greendale, and when I was nine years old, my super religious dad wouldn't let my older brother and me go trick-or-treating because he said, Halloween is Satan's holiday. Instead of going out in cute costumes and filling plastic buckets with candy, we had to stay in and watch The Exorcist. Like Nine-year-old me believed everything in that movie was real, so it wasn't long before I was terrified and on the verge of tears. I told my dad I didn't want to watch the movie, and he responded by saying, that's okay, you don't have to watch it, you can just sit there and listen to it which I did, and my imagination ran wild with the most horrifying thoughts spawned by what I was hearing. Fortunately, I'm older and wiser now. I can eat as much Halloween candy as I want, and in honor of Satan's holiday, I can bring you this list of book recs featuring Satan or demons, starting with The Gentleman by Forrest Leo, a book that presents the devil in a way you may not have seen before. The story is set in the Victorian era and follows a poet named Lionel Savage. He falls on hard times and subsequently marries Vivian Lancaster for her money. But he's disenchanted with married life and is struggling to write because of it. He then inadvertently makes a deal with the devil, trading his wife for the ability to write again. Before long, Lionel realizes that the trade was a terrible mistake and he embarks on a journey to find hell so he can get Vivian back. A few delightfully quirky characters join him, including his progressive kid sister Lizzie, and hijinks ensue. Now, the story is told by Lionel, who's an amusing narcissist, but it's edited by Vivian's cousin, Hubert Lancaster, who does not like Lionel. So throughout the book, we're privy to snarky footnotes from the editor that add an extra layer of humor to the story of madcap adventurers and their over-the-top encounters. The Gentleman is all about the journey, not the destination. It's an entertaining, witty book with a unique take on the devil that I highly recommend, especially if you could use a laugh. Before I move on, I want to add my own footnote to this book. On page 106, there's a footnote that mentions two of the characters in this book journeying to find El Dorado. If anybody knows Forrest Leo, please tell him that I desperately wish he would write a sequel to The Gentleman telling that story. Where are my Last of Us fans at? Because this next book is for you. Between Two Fires by Christopher Buhlman is one of the wildest dark rides I've been on this year. Here's the setup. The year is 1348, and fallen angels have projected their ire for God on humankind, causing famine, war, and the Black Plague. In a world that's ravaged with blight and full of rotting corpses, we meet a disgraced knight named Thomas. Thomas crosses paths with a girl orphaned by the plague, but she's no ordinary girl. She has visions and prophetic dreams. She says the plague is only part of a much larger cataclysm, and she insists that the fallen angels under Lucifer are preparing for a war and humankind will be caught in the crossfire. She needs to travel to a place where she believes she can stop the evil that threatens Earth, and the faithless Thomas reluctantly agrees to escort her across a depraved medieval landscape. Along the way, they meet an alcoholic priest who joins their party, and the three of them embark on a quest filled with monsters of mythic proportions, hellish creatures, risen corpses, horrifying temptresses, and of course, angels and demons. What first presents as an epic tale of medieval horror proves to be an increasingly surprising and deeply symbolic story of searching for the soul and aspiring for redemption amid hell on earth. So if you like your horror to have deep thematic resonance, this is the book for you. On a similarly dark note, we have Johannes Cabal, The Necromancer, the first in a five-book series by Jonathan L. Howard. Now, clearly, Johannes is a necromancer, but he's also a scientist, a snob, and a man who sold his soul years ago, and now he wants it back. Now, step one of this journey is to have a little chat with Satan in hell. And I just have to say that this book's opening chapters have my favorite depiction of hell out of every book I've read up to this point. It's a hell featuring your standard fiery pits, but also the stifling bureaucracy, long waiting times, and mountains of paperwork sound relatably hellish. So anyway, Johannes goes to Satan and says, I want my soul back. And Satan, 
who happens to be bored, proposes a wager. He'll give Johannes his soul back if he can persuade 100 people to sign over their souls to the devil, and he has to do it within one year. If Johannes succeeds, he'll get his soul back. And if he fails, he'll get no soul and he'll be damned forever. That's already an interesting wager, but then Satan spices things up by offering Johannes access to a traveling circus to help lure people who will sign away their souls. After Johannes agrees to this deal, he pulls together a motley crew to operate the traveling circus, including his brother, who's a vampire. And remember, Johannes is a necromancer, so you can probably guess where some of his other crew members come from. Together, they travel through the English countryside, wielding black magic with great success, but of course, a deal with Satan could never be simple, and when he ups the stakes, Johannes resorts to increasingly desperate, dare I say, devilish means to acquire souls, and mayhem ensues. This book is funny and fiendish, but also psychologically and morally complex. Like, the story went to some places I was not expecting. One moment I'd be laughing, and the next moment I was horrified. <laughs> Johannes Cabal, The Necromancer, is a great read for this time of year. It's super quirky, a really good audiobook, and it had an ending I did not see coming. If you want a book with super natural suspense and humor, be sure to check this one out. The Summer That Melted Everything by Tiffany McDaniel is Southern Gothic fiction that ranked among my top reads of 2023. The story takes place in 1980s Ohio, and it kicks off with a man named Autopsy Bliss, publishing in the local newspaper a cordial invitation to Satan to visit their town. The next day, Autopsy's son Fielding meets a bruised and ragged boy dressed in overalls who points to the invitation in the paper and says he's come to town because he was invited. The boy claims to be the Prince of Darkness, and he goes by Sal, a name derived from the first part of Satan and the L in Lucifer. After Sal's arrival, the town is enveloped in a heat wave rendered with atmospheric writing that summons all the dripping sweat and sticky discomfort of a scorching hot summer. Amid the heat, strange things start happening around the town, and the townspeople are astir with fear and speculation about Sal. Meanwhile, Fielding is made privy to Sal's bouts of wisdom, his insightful monologues, and his stories about God and hell that leave Fielding wondering if he truly is in the presence of the devil. Now, this is a book comprised of deeply flawed characters and mounting paranoia. It's the kind of book that keeps you guessing as the tension rises slowly, and the story is steeped in mystery, happenstance, and uncertainty. If you enjoy Southern Gothic fiction with gorgeous prose, or if you're a fan of the unsettling probability of Shirley Jackson's work, then I implore you to read this book. Let's talk about Two-Step Devil by Jamie Quattro, in which the devil is a beguiling figure whose presence and voice grow increasingly strange and more assertive with each passing chapter. This book explores the carnal and the divine in daily life through the story of a 70-year-old man who lives off the grid in Lookout Mountain, Alabama. He's referred to as the prophet because he has prophetic visions, which he then paints or transforms into art pieces. One day he's out scrounging for materials in the scrapyard when he sees a car stop at an abandoned gas station. Inside the car is a teen girl named Michael whose wrists are zip-tied. The prophet believes she's a messenger sent by God to take his visionary warnings of the coming end times to the White House so he contrives to rescue her and bring her back to his cabin where the devil is a shadowy figure lurking in the corner. Thus begins the story of an unlikely friendship between two strangers who live on the margins of society. While the prophet's backstory is unveiled, Michael's future unfolds. Meanwhile, the devil emerges from the shadows to taunt the prophet and eventually the reader. This is an incredibly ambitious book. The structure is playful and innovative. The story is complex, gritty, and painful. It's the kind of story that's difficult to turn away from even when you want to because it goes to some really dark places, but does so with such finesse that you can't help but keep reading. If you want to spar with the devil this month by reading an elevated, nuanced story of fate and faith, love and loss, and check out Two-Step Devil.
This next book is one of my favorite works of classic literature, in part because of the lurid reputation it gained for its profanity and obscenity when it was first published in 1796. I'm talking about The Monk by Matthew Lewis. This is gothic horror about a respected monk who's so overtaken with desire for a young girl that he abandons his monastic vows and embarks on a terrifying descent into a life of diabolical depravity. Now, at one point, it's a story within a story, but overall, it is a beautifully written tale of betrayal, torture, murder, and other depraved acts that I will not mention here for fear of spoiling things for you. The point is, with its themes of sexual desire and abuse of power, it follows naturally that the devil would come into play. He makes a small but highly memorable appearance in this book, solidifying it as one of the greatest stories of justice I've ever read. I mentioned that this book was considered blasphemous in 1796, but I think it's still a scintillating and devastating story of a pious man succumbing to greed and lust, even by today's standards. So if you wanna be shocked or moved by a story written with transcendent prose, don't miss this one. Footnote, I included The Monk in my best of 2017 reads on my old booktube channel, and I still get messages from people saying they read this book on my recommendation and loved it, and could I recommend something similar? But I still can't. After all this time, I have yet to find anything else like it. So if you can recommend a book that is equally lyrical and arresting with a memorable conclusion, please let me know. You know that feeling you get when you're listening to someone's implausible tale of a supernatural experience they had, and you don't feel inclined to believe it, but they speak in such earnest that the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end? That's how I felt while reading the opening pages of The Devil's Best Trick by Randall Sullivan. This is nonfiction that blends true crime and literary history to chart how evil and the devil have been portrayed in historical, religious, and cultural contexts across centuries. I found that concept highly intriguing and I was keen to read this book, but whoa, did it turn out to be so much more disturbing than I expected and somewhat problematic? We'll get to that. But first, let's talk about the opening pages because they are riveting. Now, Randall begins with the story of a woman named Michelle. When Michelle was a teenager, she befriended a girl from out of town named Mary, who shared with her stories of vividly detailed dreams she had about a dilapidated house with a red light in the front of it and the horrible sacrificial things a group of people did inside that house. Mary told Michelle that she dreamed of the people at that house running a boy down with a car and also hanging a teen boy from a tree, like really creepy stuff. Michelle's last encounter with Mary involved a knife and that's all I'm gonna say about that. She survived that encounter, and because she was a skilled artist, she decided to draw with as much detail as possible the stories that Mary had told her. She took the drawings to the police department, shared everything she was told, and the drawings were then forwarded to Mary's hometown, where the police were astounded by Michelle's drawings. You see, there was a house with a red light that had recently burned down under mysterious circumstances. And a 15 year old boy had been killed in a hit and run a couple blocks from that house. Further, Michelle's drawings matched with eerie exactitude the site where 17 year old Tate Rowland had been found hanging from a tree just a couple weeks before Michelle met Mary. Now that's the start of the true crime narrative that's threaded throughout the first half of this book. And for me, it was the most riveting aspect of The Devil's Best Trick. The more Sullivan dug into this case and the mysterious circumstances surrounding Tate Rowland's death, the weirder it got. And Sullivan does a fantastic job of bringing the case to a thrilling new discovery and then pausing the story to keep you on the edge of your seat. During those pauses, Sullivan examines how evil and the devil have appeared throughout history, ranging from Mesopotamian or Egyptian gods and religious texts, all the way to 19th century literature and the satanic panic of the 1980s. These passages are brief yet dense, and I sometimes felt like they were pulled from a completely different book, and yet I was fascinated by the section that charts portrayals of the devil in classic literature. I was intrigued to discover how the devil's image that many of us picture today was shaped more by literature 
than it was by religious texts. In the second half of the book, Sullivan shares an unsettling anonymous letter he received in the mail while writing this book. He then writes about a couple of serial killers he had to look into at various points in his career. And despite Sullivan being discreet, this portion of the book is graphic and deeply unsettling. And finally, Sullivan shares his time spent in Mexico researching the history of the Aztecs as well as witches and black magic. Then he circles back to Tate Rowland's death to bring the book to a chilling conclusion. Why is the book problematic? Because in researching it, Sullivan went to Texas and he went to Mexico, just two places, and yet he concludes that Mexico is the epicenter of the devil's power on earth, which some people have understandably taken offense to. Also, if you're sensitive about essay, murder, child abuse, or animals being harmed, note that it's all in here, so proceed with caution. The Devil's Best Trick is not a flawless book. It covers a lot and it can feel disjointed at times, but it's nonetheless fascinating and it undeniably makes for a super creepy read. Did you know that before Eve, Adam had a wife named Lilith who's remembered as a demoness? In Lilith by Nikki Marmory, we get a feminist take on Lilith's origin story. She and Adam are equals in the garden until Adam demands that Lilith submit to him. And when she refuses, she's banished from paradise. Now, incidentally, Lilith is typically depicted as something like this, because of course a woman who refuses to conform to male authority gets demonized. Anyway, Lilith has a secret. Before she was forced out of paradise, she tasted the fruit of the tree of knowledge. That's why she knows about God's wife, Asherah, the queen of heaven, and the fact that Asherah is missing. Now, after Adam's new wife, Eve, is created to be readily subservient to him, Lilith decides that she must restore the balance between men and women by enlightening Eve, finding the missing queen of heaven, and regaining her rightful place in paradise. Tasting the forbidden fruit made Lilith immortal, so her quest for justice spans centuries, during which time we see her exploring love, intimacy, motherhood, and continually clashing with God's angels. It's a story woven with themes of independence, bodily autonomy, and breaking free from patriarchal constraints, and it just happens to be written with gorgeous prose reminiscent of Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. You'll see me talk about this book again in my Best Books of 2024 video. I cannot recommend it highly enough, and that includes the audiobook. The Good Demon by Jimmy Cajolis is not your usual story of demonic possession. It's a lyrically written YA novel of small town horror. The story centers on a girl named Claire who's devastated when the Reverend and his son rip her demon from her. They call it a deliverance, but Claire loved her demon like a sister, and the ache of loneliness in her absence compels Claire to do whatever is necessary to get her demon back, even if it means teaming up with the Reverend's son. You may have heard me rave about Jimmy Cajolas before because I'm always urging people to read his debut novel, Goldaline. It's one of my all-time favorite books, not only because it tells a perilous story of an orphan girl living in the woods, but also because it's so beautifully written. And The Good Demon is laced with that signature writing style. Now, even amid all the darkness in this book, some of the sentences are so stunning that they took my breath away. And while Claire's demon is not as prevalent in this book as I anticipated, she is the catalyst that launches Claire on a journey filled with small town secrets, unsolved mysteries, gruesome magic, and untrustworthy spirits. It's a twisty tale of self-discovery and empowerment that defies expectations, and a touching reminder that we all have our demons. They just manifest in different ways. Finally, The Amulet of Samarkand by Jonathan Stroud is such a favorite of mine that I included it in my list of 10 must-have fantasy and sci-fi books in my fallout shelter. It's a hefty middle-grade dark fantasy set in modern-day London with magic and wizards. That may sound familiar, but trust me, this is not like those books written by she who must not be named. This book follows two characters. The first is a young magician's apprentice named Nathaniel, who finds himself ruthlessly humiliated in front of everyone by a hotshot wizard. Nathaniel's already a 
troubled boy, and this incident sends him over the edge. He becomes obsessed with getting revenge and turns to dark magic to achieve his goal. The second character is a genie named Bartimaeus, whom Nathaniel summons as part of his plan for revenge. But summoning Bartimaeus and controlling him are not the same thing. When Nathaniel sends Bartimaeus out as part of his wicked plans, the genie goes off on his own mischievous tangents. And all the while, we're privy to humorous and snarky footnotes from Bartimaeus in which he shares ancient knowledge and provides insights on what it's like to live for thousands of years. The Amulet of Samarkand is a tale of magical espionage, blackmail, betrayal, and murder. It's also my favorite story of anti-heroes, and it's the first book in a fantastic trilogy, along with a wonderful prequel. So if you're looking to get lost in a sweeping tale of brooding characters and ancient beings, be sure to give this one a read. What are your October reading plans? Are you reaching for spooky books, Victorian lit, or gothic horror? And will you be dressing up to trick or treat on Halloween, or will you stay in to watch scary movies? Tell me all about your plans for this month in the comments. I wish you happy reading, and I'll see you in the next- What the hell was that? Okay, seriously, what? <gasps>